Thank you. Hello, everybody. Okay, so today I'm going to show you how initialization order works in Scala on several small examples. The idea here is to show you that it's not as simple as in Java and to show you some common ways to overcome the problems that can be caused by the initialization order. So to start off, start, let me introduce myself. I'm Dark Demius on GitHub. I'm indeed doing a PhD at EBFL under supervision of Mart Martin Nadersky. Uh, previously, I've been working on performance-centric implementation of collections for Scala, Scala Blitz. Uh, I, recently, I have been working on the new Dota compiler with Martin, and more precisely, I, for last year, I have been working on the optimizer for Dota that should bring the similar performance advantages for all, all Dota compiled code. So to show off that uh, I actually know what I'm saying, here are the stats of how much code in the upcoming Dota compiler is written by different contributors. As you can see, me and Martin have more or less the same amount of code written in it. Okay, so background. We're talking about initialization order. So we start with a platform which we run on, and that's Java. So what Java has is Java it has classes, and Java has interfaces. Only classes have fields or initialization statements. And every class can inherit only a single other class. What it means is that the, it's very clear to, to uh, and it's really easy to understand in which order will those initialization statements be called. Because they get in executed from a super class to the subclass. In case of Scala, okay, so all, over this presentation, I'm You can try with mine, at least. Let me try yours. Okay, I don't feel comfortable look here, so have this. You just started working. <laughs> okay, over this presentation, I would use okay. this. It works if you really want. So over this presentation, I will use this small helper function. <laughs> okay. okay. Did it? It works once again. Okay. Okay. Over this presentation, I will use a small helper function, which seems to cause bugs in microphone. Uh, <laughs> Which, what it does, it says that, okay, I'm going to initialize this field, and that's how I'm going to use it. So if we have a class A, just to show how the initialization order works in Scala, or in Java, let's say you have a field A, which you initialize, and when you initialize, you print A dot A, and you have a class B, which has a print B, field B, which you, when you initialize, you print B dot B. Yeah, a typo. Uh, it's quite obvious in what order the execution here happens. First, the A gets initialized, and only then the B gets initialized. Uh, unlike this, in Scala, we have traits. And traits also have fields. And traits also have multiple statements in the body. What it means, and given the fact that we have multiple inheritance of traits, getting the order in which these fields should get initialized and these statements in initializers executed is not always obvious. Uh, an order of executions of these statements could matter. You can either see the data which is not yet initialized or which is initialized, uh, initialized to some intermediate state that's going to change. I will show you this on several examples in the next slides. So the simple examples are here. Uh, so here we have two traits, A and B, like we used to have in the previous slide for classes. And we're going to mix in those traits in a class AB, which well, well, extends them. If we create an instance of this class AB, what's going to happen? Uh, in what order are going these things to be printed? In what order are the fields initialized? So here it's quite simple. Uh, the order is defined by linearization order. So first we mix in A, and this means that the A gets initialized first. And only then we mix in B, and this means that the B gets initialized second. If we change this example slightly by changing the order of the traits, it would mean that the field gets initialized in the opposite order. So the first thing that gets printed will be b.b, and the second one a.a. A. Yeah. 
Okay, so now let's change this example slightly. We'll make trade B extend the trade A. And we'll try to see whether it would matter in which order do we extend those trades. Uh, in this example, well, we start by extending the A. And yes, the A gets analyzed first. And as you can see, when we extend B, though B extends A, we don't get A initialized once again. Uh, in this example, where we change the order of the straights when extending B, well, B extends A already. So the B will require A to be initialized, and only then it will initialize itself. And because we already initialized A, it's not going to call itself once again. So there is a lot of machinery happening here, which starts from linearization order. And these examples are still simple, but building on the simple examples, you can go into more complicated examples. So that's a place where I will start asking audience to see whether the thing that's going to happen is the one that you would expect. Okay, so here, what I will do first is I will put the initialization statement, a print on here, and try to print what are the values of the fields at this particular moment of initialization. Uh, so does anybody in the audience know what's going to be printed by the sprint line? Yes, please. One and no, not null. That's an integer field. Yes. So you're going to access the field B here before it was initialized. Though it's a val and you assume it doesn't change, well, during constructor it does. So you're actually going to access the default value of the field, which for uh, primitives is a zero respective type, and for object references in, is indeed now. Okay, uh, now we change it slightly and we print it after. Uh, well, here uh, the most obvious thing happens. You're going to access the see the field that you just initialized. I have a question for the audience here. In this print line, can you always assume that in trade B, that's written this way, you would always be able to see the field B that has the non-default value that has been initialized? Who in this audience thinks that we're going, we're, we're, there is no way we can break the assumption that B was initialized? Does anybody think? Okay, some people think. Okay, here's the counterexample. So let's say I have a class AB, which the only thing it does, it overrides B. Okay, what's going to happen here? What's going to be printed? Who in the audience thinks that's going to be printed one and two? Okay, some people. Uh, the thing that's actually going to be printed is zero, once again. Uh, I have a big question why, and in order to answer this question why, I'll need to go into some technical details of how it works. But before we go into those, I'll give you one more example, which is also counterintuitive. I'll change two things in these slides. First, I will make the field in the overriding class final. Second, I will remove the init call. Both of the things matter. If, you're don't for if you forget to do either of those, you won't be able to observe the effect. So what's going to happen here is you're going to actually see the future value. You're not seeing the uninitialized value. You didn't see the value that you just initialized. You're going to see the value that your subclass is going to use. Okay, so in order to explain how this works, I need to go back into, well, the theory, how Scala compiler is building, and the implementation details. So the theory is simple, initialization order. It tells in which order the statements are going to execute it, be executed. The tricky part comes what statements. And the question what statements are being executed is actually the implementation detail. So I'll need to go into how actually mixing composition is implemented in Scala or oh, in Dottie. So the main parts which implement mixing composition are the notion of what are getters, what are constructions, what are trait setters, and what are trait initializers. Uh, so the getters are simple things. Uh, when you initialize either a mutable or immutable field, uh, you would like to have to be able to access it. Scala always creates getters for you. When you, ac when you assume that your accent is in a field in Scala, you're act actually accessing a getter which reads this field. It's an early desugaring which is done in both compilers, both Doty and Scala, and it works quite straightforward. 
So it creates a private field in most cases with a name mangled name that you would never be able to use because you're not supposed to write dollars in your programs. And the getter gets the name of the actual field that you defined in the source code. Uh, in the phase constructors, the code that you have wrote in your body of the class actually is transformed to something which is very similar to what ER constructors for Java. So let's say here that you had several fields. And uh, well, you had statements between them that need to be executed formally before these fields are initialized. So what's going to be done is all the statements are going to be lifted in the body of the constructor method. And the fields are going to be just, as in Java, defined, but you cannot initialize them just here. Uh, does anybody see a problem with this code? Any experienced Java programmers seeing what can be done here? Sorry? Well, there can be methods in the interface since Java 8. So, in, in, but that's true that in, in, for Java less than 8, Scalacy actually compiles this method to a separate implementation class. But that's not the detail that I'm talking about. The detail is here. I have a trait which has fields. And final needs to be, all, all of them need to be in the constructor. Yes. So first of all, object needs to be initialized in the constructor. Second, uh, well, traits don't have fields at Java at all even on the bytecode level. So this doesn't work like this. Fields cannot, there cannot be fields in the interfaces in bytecode. So instead, uh, we have trait setters. So how it's actually compiled is the interface defines something which are actually setters for the fields which you assume are immutable, which are to be defined by class who actually creates the field. So, and instead of assigning the field, the, construct, the trait constructor, which cannot access the field, we'll just call this method, passing the value to be assigned. Okay, and then it means that the implementation class also needs to do something. He needs to call the methods, which are the trait initializers, in the order defined by the linearization, which defines, uh, which, which is actually the part defined by spec. All the remainder part is implementation defined things. So it has to implement trait setters because traits need to be, have a way to actually set the fields of the class that they cannot allocate. It needs to create these fields themselves. And it also needs to forward some methods actually because the traits in our case can define methods, but in Java they can't, or, or Java 8 they can, but the, over, the way how they result is different. And that's the main reason why in Scala collections you have classes like abstract traversable, because you don't want to do it multiple times because it takes bytecode. So it means in the end that if there is an implementation class implementing this trait A, then uh, it should define, as I said, several fields to illustrate in this example. And it should define setters for these fields that would actually set, set the value for the trait. And it needs to call this initializer. The tricky part here is the one that you understood from the start. There is a bad thing now. Because now we have other methods accessing the fields, which aren't constructors, these fields can't be final anymore. And this breaks some of the optimization that hotspot had, could have been done. This breaks in lining. This breaks multiple things. So this compilation scheme is good in terms of that it's very powerful, but it's bad in terms of, well, it breaks assumptions that we would have hotspot to understand. Uh, Doty has a different compilation scheme because of this. In Doty, instead of having a single init method, we will have init methods per field. So in Scala C, the compiler still had to know that there were those fields because he needed to allocate them. He needed to know that there were those superclasses that he needed to call. Now, instead in Doty, we will use the second knowledge to know what methods should be called, which were the field. We will use the knowledge which fields were there in your super, super traits. So we will define a method that sets, that returns the initial value to be set by a class. And it's responsible executing the statements which were before it. It's not responsible in setting this value. It doesn't pass it somewhere. And what it allows us is that now the implementation class in Doty 
ha can just call this method as normal. And the only place where the fields are assigned is constructor. It, and it once again allows us to make these fields final. That's why actually the code generated by DOT is better optimized by hotspot. Okay. Uh, the other advantage that it allows us is that it, we can easily understand what went in this example. So this was a first tricky example that uh, went quite easy because it happens to work fine here. Uh, what happens here is that A defines either initial method or a trait setter that AB needs to either call or implement. The same is done by B. So what AB does is it first calls the trait initializer of A, which calls the, the trait setter of A, and then the control is being returned to the constructor of AB. Then AB calls the trait initializer of B, which sets the field B. And as expected, by the time that println is being executed, all the fields are set. Now we get to the tricky examples. So the first tricky example was this one, which was just access out of our execution. As we saw previously, uh, compiler treats initialization of fields as normal statements. It doesn't execute them any way out of order. It means that, well, the println here gets executed as soon as you start executing the trait initializer for B, and you're able to see uninitialized field, as in Scala, as in Java. That's the more complicated example. The example where we're overriding a field which is also defined by a super trait. What happens here is actually an optimization, which happened to be implemented in Scala C a long time ago, and which defined how this works for generations to come. Uh, because AB knows that this is going to redefine B, it knows that the value that the superlast is going to set doesn't actually matter. And for the sake of saving the bytecode, it's actually going to make the setter do nothing. The setter will consume the value that's to be assigned, but it won't do anything with it. It won't set it anywhere. And this means that though the initializer for B gets executed, the value for it is going to be discarded. Uh, in this example, this is, this is a different optimization that's being used here. Uh, it, in this example, it knows that the field for B is actually going to be the same all the time. It knows that it's a constant, and it knows that initializing it doesn't create any side effects. So compiler plays, plays a trick on you. Instead of creating a field, it just creates a method that always returns the same value without treating the field. What it means is that uh, accessing those fi this field entirely ignores the initialization order. The setter still exists, and some super traits, super classes may be trying to assign the field, but it doesn't matter. They, independently on what's the value of underlying field, the getter is always going to return the very same value. In this case, constant three. Uh, Actually, the same trick actually breaks the forward references in the same class. So if you'll try to define a class which has a final val b equals and the forward reference to the next final val, then normally you would see an initialized value. If you have final vals, both final, both vals, and whose right hand state is known to be a constant, those ones would ignore initialization order even a single class. So the examples that I demonstrated to you were here to show you that there are kernel cases in, in initialization order. And if you're doing something like cake pattern, when you have a lot of traits initializing a lot of fields, you may be falling in a problem that you, don't, you stop understanding the order in which fields get initialized. And there are some solutions currently existing in Scala compiler. There are some solutions that Godota is going to bring, and there is one more solution that I'm going to propose you here. So the first solution is simple. Let's make all the fields lazy. What it would mean is that the field is going to be initialized the first time it's accessed. It, it gives us the advantage that uh, you know that 
you're never going to see the uninitialized field. But it gives us the disadvantage that accessing this field, you'll need to synchronize to make sure, because lazy valves are thread safe in Scala, that they needed to take a pay a price for this, and they need to check one more field to check if they're initialized. So accessing a synchronized block here and doing an if statement is a lot slower than accessing normal field. And not only is it slower, it's not inlined by hotspot by default. Hotspot assumes that hotspot has a magic hard-coded knowledge of what getter is. Getter is a method that the only thing it does, it reads a single field and returns it right away. So this method won't stop being treated as getters by hotspot and won't stop being optimized as getters by hotspot. The other problem is lazy valves in Scala C may cause spurious deadlocks. This is, an imp this is an implementation detail, but it comes from the same problem. When you're accessing a lazy valve, you're synchronizing over this. Now think if you have two objects depending on each other and they you start accessing them, both of them synchronize over this, and they, then they start uh, trying to refer to each other. You can cause a deadlock here. For more details, you can have a look at my Scala world presentation. I'm showing there the details how lazy valves are implemented in Scala and the difference how they're implemented in Dottie. Well, here I will give you a short summary. In Dottie, lazy valves don't cause spurious deadlocks. Uh, you cannot just make a class which deadlocks simply because of the way you access it, uh, because of lazy valves. There, additionally, the lazy valves in Doty happen to be a bit faster. It, it's not different that matters much, they're like faster by 10% and on this scale it doesn't matter, but that's a pleasant thing to have, that it didn't need, at least the valves didn't slow it down. The other thing that in Doty you have both thread safe and thread unsafe lazy valves. So you can opt in to have a lazy valve, which does check in if it's initialized, but it does it in thread non-safe way then you'll pay a lot less overhead for accessing it after it's initialized. Okay, there is also an alternative, which comes from actually GVM bytecode. There are some tricks that you can do in GVM bytecode, which you can do in Java. Uh, before you call a super constructor in a class or a trait, you can actually access fields and you can set fields. You cannot call any methods in this class. You cannot call any other methods but you can assign fields before you call superconstructor. And Scala has a syntax for doing this, and this is called early definitions. So in this example, class C extends this magical block, and what this block says is that, well, this is kind of your first superclass in terms of linearization. And, it, and kind of its constructor gets invoked even before you invoke a constructor of your next class. So what would happen here? He said the value of the name would be set before you call your superconstructor. This is a solution for this problem, but I would argue that that's actually a bad thing to do because it makes it hard to understand what happens in a complicated code base. Scala C, the current Scala compiler, relies on this feature a lot. That's the way how it constructs its own cake pattern in order to solve the installation problem. It needs to inject a reference to the compiler into phases before the compiler is constructed by constructing phases. And that's how it does it. Doty doesn't do this because it became a mess as soon as you had a lot of phases and the cake grow, grew huge. Well, he, the spec actually has an interesting sentence about early definitions. Spec has a small comment saying that early definitions are particularly useful for traits that do not have constructor parameters. Well, why don't they? Why don't have traits constructor parameters? Well, there is a SIP for this. There is a SIP 25 proposed by Martin Udersky around a year ago, which is implemented in Dottie. And in Dottie, traits can have constructor parameters. And this becomes natural. You can easily write the code like this. And then you've passed a value to your superclass, or super trait in this case. And it's obvious what's the value that you're passing there, and initialization order is obvious. Though, as I said, this is not yet implemented in Scala C, 
uh, there is a question if, if it would be by the release of 2.12. Likely that it's not. Okay. This does not solve the problem of accessing partially or not initialized fields. Why doesn't it? Because you can be passing a value that your subclass is going to overwrite once again. In all of these examples that I showed you, except lazy vals, you can have a val overridden by a different val with different value. Now let's say that you start initializing using this value and you rely on this value. Uh, you, you shouldn't do this. It's not the way it's going to work. So in order to solve this problem, I have a, even a crazier idea that I'm playing around now. Uh, what if we make fields, these vals, act as if they were lazy only during the constructor invocation? We know that constructor invocation is performed in a single thread because it didn't publish the object yet. Other threads don't yet have access to it. It means that we don't need to synchronize. If we additionally require that all the fields are forced by the end of the constructor invocation, then you would need to pay a price for accessing the fields after. That's a wonderful idea that I've shared with Martin and it sounds great. The problem here, it breaks happens before. It breaks your assumptions about in what order is code executed because then suddenly the, the fields will get forced before the statements before, before them. So for example, in all the examples that I showed when you were kind of trying to access an initialized field, you won't be able to. By trying to access an initialized field, you would initialize it. And this may break assumptions in, the in your programs. You may have programs that only run because of such bugs. And funny enough, we, when I try to implement this, Doty broke. We have parts in Doty that run only because of such bugs. I got to fix them since then, but it was funny to see how severe those issues can be. So I mean, that's, a, that's why I call this crazy idea. If we were to design a new language, that's maybe the way I would start doing it. But now we have a huge code base and we need to consider the ecosystem that we have with us. Okay, so the takeaway message here. Uh, if you can, try not to define while and traits. Devs are better in most cases and behave more reliably. You can, ov you can implement a dev by a val, and that's fine. But implementing a val by a val can be tricky. Uh, try not to use early definitions unless you really have to. Because early definitions break normal assumptions of people how, of order of execution. You can have traits that set some particular value and they assume that they will be able to read this value. And early definitions is the simplest way to break this assumption. In long term, we will have trait constructors. We, will, we have already implemented it. The SIP has been submitted. The scale improvement process. process has been started. And this is going to be a long-term solution for this problem. Well, but if you actually need to have files, for example, if you have dependent types on those, uh, most of the code doesn't need to be that kind of performance-centric. You don't need to optimize most of your code. You need to optimize only the important part. Lazy files aren't actually that slow. They introduce some performance slowdown, but it only matters in the places which care about performance much. Okay, th thank you, and please ask your questions. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, the question was whether we are designing Dota over GV GVM the same as Scala. Uh, when Scala was initially designed, it was designed in, was targeting specifically GVM and specifically Hotspot. Now we have Scala.js backend, and there may be a new backend com announcement coming in Scala days, but I, didn't, but I didn't say this to you. It may have some symbol which looks like metal and has some scratches on it, but I didn't say this to you. Uh, <laughs> so we're developing Doty with several different targets in mind. Uh, the problem here comes with the same thing that we already have ecosystem. 
And this ecosystem assumes hotspot-like behavior. It assumes hotspot-like runtime. It assumes Java libraries. And coming up with a way to make other backends not be second, second kind citizens without breaking existing code is hard. We're trying to make it better for them, but we're trying as much not to break your existing code. Thank you for a wonderful question. Other questions? Yes, so you have the only five seconds left, so if there are any questions, please uh, leave them and uh, ask during the coffee break. Thank you, Dmitry Petrashko. Thank you.